30 Minutes Over Oregon, A Japanese Pilot's World War II Story by Mark Tyler Nobleman. 30 Minutes Over Oregon, A Japanese Pilot's World War II Story by Mark Tyler Nobleman, illustrated by Melissa E.Y., published by Clarion Books. Prologue on December 7, 1941, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, an American naval base on Hawaii. The surprise attack killed thousands of soldiers and brought America into World War II. To retaliate, the U.S. bombed Tokyo from the sky. This became known as the Doolittle Raid, which would later be memorialized in both a book and film called 30 Seconds Over Tokyo. In response, Japan set out to prove that continental America, though far from all World War II combat, could also be bombed. This is the story of what happened next. 15 miles off the Oregon coast on September 9th 1942, Nabua Fujita strode across the slippery deck of a submarine. He gripped the 400-year-old samurai sword that had been in his family for generations. Come on, he told his navigator, it will soon be sunup. They climbed into a small plane that was about to be launched by catapult toward the United States. As he did before every flight, Nabua strapped the sword to his seat for luck. Crew members loaded 168-pound bombs under each wing of the plane. The Japanese hoped that the bombs would start a fire that would consume the Oregon woods, then rage into nearby towns and cities. Do not tell anyone, Nabua's commander had told him not even your wife. So instead of sharing with Ayako what Japan had entrusted him to do, Naboa left strands of hair and fingernail clippings for her to bury if he didn't make it back. If the American military shot at him, his plane would not be fast enough to evade being hit. The catapult flung the plane off the sub with a hard, Whoosh! Steering into the rising sun, Nabua scanned the sky for American fighters but saw none. When he flew over the tiny town of Brookings, Oregon, some of the residents heard the motor. A few saw the plane puttering through the fog, but almost none suspected it was an enemy aircraft. Shortly after 6 a.m. high above the thickly wooded mountains, nine miles east of Brookings, Nabua gave his navigator the order. The bombs are to be dropped here. Nabua wheeled the plane. Over his shoulder, he caught sight of a white flash below. He beelined back to the ocean flying low enough to clip treetops. He landed on the water, and the sub-crew hoisted the plane aboard with a crane. They quickly removed the wings and floats and stowed everything in a watertight hangar. The sub then dove 250 feet. Meanwhile, the forest was burning a bit. Only one of the two bombs had exploded, sparking patches of fire that didn't spread. The ground was too damp from recent rain. The other bomb had buried itself on impact without a trace. Four men from forest lookout stations spotted smoke and trudged several hours to the remote site and extinguished the flames. They figured the fire was caused by lightning, 
but they noticed a splintered tree and beneath it a small pit in a circle of scorched earth. Widening the pit into a crater, they uncovered metal fragments. Some had markings in Japanese. The news that a foreign foe had flown in and out of American airspace undetected zipped through Brookings. Townsfolk were shaken, but many were more concerned for their relatives fighting overseas. Several newspapers put forth the notion that the plane may have taken off from a sub, but this was dismissed as improbable. The military assumed that the incident was isolated and did little to increase their efforts to defend the coast. Twenty days after the bombing, Nabua did it again. Same plan, same plane. Only that time, for greater stealth, he went by night. To protect coastal communities from becoming easy targets, the U.S. military routinely ordered blackouts during the war. But the lighthouse at Cape Blanco remained lit and guided to shore by its beam. Nabua headed to a wooded area north of Brookings and dropped two more bombs on Oregon. On his return, Nabua could not locate the sub. Nearly out of fuel, he resigned himself to dying with honor by winging back and crashing into the lighthouse. The mission comes first, the sub next, he said to his navigator. We come last. But a moment later he glimpsed a dark, snaky shimmer on the ocean swells, an oil leak from his sub. The Japanese believed the second two bombs had detonated. Americans scoured the woods but found no fragments and no damage. Or if they did, they kept quiet about it. Either way, Japan claimed both invasions as victories. They had caught America off guard. After years at war, Nabua returned to Japan, anxious to rejoin Ayako and their young son and daughter, Yoshi and Yuriko. As his ship pulled into port, into home, Nabua gazed through binoculars to mask his tears. In 1945, Japan surrendered to the United States and its allies, ending World War II. Nabua opened a hardware store and lived quietly in a Tokyo suburb. He never discussed his Oregon raids, though they were rarely out of his mind, and the residents of Brookings largely forgot about their close call until 1962. That year, the Brookings JCs, a leadership organization, was looking for a way to boost tourism to their sleepy burg. One member had a bold idea. He suggested that they track down the Japanese bomber pilot and invite him to attend their annual Memorial Day festival as a guest of honor. So they did. To their surprise, Nabua accepted their invitation. And they weren't the only ones who were shocked. This was the first Nabua's family had heard of what he had done in America. One U.S. newspaper published a petition condemning the idea. Those who signed felt that any soldier saluted in Brookings should be American. Furthermore, it would be expensive to fly over Nabua, Ayako, and Yoshi, now 26, who would act as a translator. 
Despite the pressure to cancel the visit, the JCs didn't give in. Welcoming Nabua, they announced, would be a symbol of reconciliation not just between individuals, but between nations. Another newspaper printed a letter from a veteran who wrote, He was doing a job, and we were doing a job. Other veterans, including the Governor of Oregon and President John F. Kennedy, also praised the invitation. Protesters began to open their minds. Yet, Nabua was nervous. Initially, he had feared that Americans were tricking him into coming so they could put him on trial as a war criminal. He worried that they would insult him, egg him, beat him, but he knew he had to go, no matter what. It would be impolite to refuse, he said. Again, he brought his family sword. This time, however, it was not for luck. Over the years, Nabua's war pride had shriveled into guilt. His brother had been lost in battle. His country had suffered catastrophically when the United States dropped atomic bombs on the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And though his bombings hadn't hurt anyone, that had been the intention. If the people of Brookings accepted the apology he planned, he would gift the sword to the town. If they did not, he would use the sword to commit seppuku, traditional Japanese suicide by a person overcome with shame. A large group of people awaited his arrival at the airport. To his relief, they greeted him and his family not with anger but with warmth. Gesturing to the jetliner he'd flown in, Nabua said in good spirit, a little larger than the plane in which I made my first trip. During the festival parade, an official introduced the Fujitas, who bowed three times to the applauding crowd. Nabua shook the hand of a six-year-old boy who said he wished to visit Japan. At a banquet in Nabua's honor, Nabua and Yoshi handed over the sword which the library would display. I never imagined I could be back in Japan alive after my flight over America, Nabua said softly, and I never dreamed I could visit the United States again. Later, Nabua met one of the men who had put out his fire. You are one of the worst fire setters in the world, the man said. If you're going to set another fire, do the same good job. A local pilot flew Nabua over the wilderness he had bombed and let him take the controls for a short while. Before leaving America, Nabua said, that he would like to host Brookings' residence in Japan one day. That day came 23 years later. At Nabua's expense, three Brookings high school students traveled to Japan. Accompanying them was the now-grown boy from the 1962 parade. For a week, Nabua toured his guests around his country. Their goodbyes were awash with emotion. The war is finally over for me, Nabua said. Nabua made three more trips back to Brookings. At a party in 1990, he was served a large submarine sandwich topped with a plane made of sliced pickles and a half-olive helmet. Nabua did not speak English, 
but everyone understood his reaction. In 1992, one day ahead of the 50th anniversary of his first bombing, he planted a tree seedling at the bomb site. In 1995, a pilot again flew him over the forest and gave him a brief chance to fly the plane himself. Nabua donated thousands of dollars to the town, specifically so the library could buy children's books that celebrate other cultures. He wondered if World War II would have been different had his generation grown up reading books like these. In 1997, Brookings got word that Nabua was not well. Urgently, a town representative flew to Tokyo to tell Nabua in person that Brookings had made him an honorary citizen, precisely 55 years after his second bombing. The next day, at 85 and at peace, Nabua passed away. The following year, as Nabua had requested, Yoroshi sprinkled some of his ashes over the bomb site. A flutist played a solo combining the national anthems of Japan and America. At the time of his death, Nabua was the only person who had bombed the United States mainland from a plane. He spent much of his life hoping no one would ever take that title from him. Author's Note What a stupid war we made. If Nabua Fujita had killed anyone in Oregon, you'd already know his name. He'd be famous in America, but not in a good way. Nabua's bombing run became known as the Lookout Air Raid. Though unprecedented, it did not even make him famous in Japan. He said he received no honors and no promotion. It had little effect on World War II. Yet it is one of the most thrilling and moving war stories I've heard, which is why I was compelled to write about it from the day I saw Nabua's 1997 New York Times obituary. The headline called him the only foe to bomb America. The World War II stories we most commonly tell about the Japanese and mainland America involve one of two events. Starting in 1942, the U.S. government forced close to 120,000 residents of Japanese descent, many of whom were American citizens, into remote internment camps, essentially prisons, in case any were spies. And in 1945, the Japanese released thousands of balloon bombs, one of which killed six people, also in Oregon. The people put into internment camps and killed by balloon bombs were civilians. They suffered as victims. Nabua was a soldier. He suffered not because of what was done to him, but because of what he had done. What a stupid war we made, Nabua said later. Though he was remorseful because of his actions, he did not pursue redemption. But when redemption pursued him, when Americans invited him to Oregon, he accepted responsibility for what he had done. He may not have been honored for attacking America, but he was honored many times over for apologizing to America. He went from fighting to uniting, which took more courage. Nabua is not the only noble figure in this story. So were the people of Brookings and the people of America 
who supported the idea of a visit from Nabua despite the often heated opposition. One of these supporters said, Surely after twenty years bitterness should be over and acts of bravery, no matter by whom, commended. Oregon Governor Mark O. Hatfield said, If we who fought Japanese are able to forgive, then I trust those few who have protested will reconsider. Nabua almost didn't survive the war, in which case there would have been no chance to reconcile. In August 1945, he was ordered to fly a kamikaze mission, destroying an enemy ship by crashing his plane into it, which would have killed him too. But five days before the mission, the war ended, his life spared, Nabua was free to embark on his next and final mission, promoting peace. <laughs>